our time limit as well. Um, um, I think it's been fascinating. We've got a very good sense of uh, the issues that are on the table. If I could give you a slightly different perspective on where I see some of the issues that were raised by the panelists, and also where do we go from here and what's happening. I think we talked a lot about the two discourses and the need to bring the economic discourse with the ecological discourse together. But I think within our community, we should start talking about the fact that there are two discourses even in ecology and environment. And we need to find a way of being able to understand those two discourses, perhaps even you, you know, challenge those, and to be able to see how do we move ahead. And I think too much of those, too little is often said about the, in, you know, the, the, the discourse that doesn't happen within the environmental movement itself. If you look at the environmental movement, which had its, there have been two distinct roots of the environmental movement. There's been a movement that was born out of the West, which came after the process of toxification, of garbage, man, of garbage uh, um, generation, which came when the Hudson was a dead river, when Thames was dying, when, when there was Minamata in Japan, when there was, um, when there was smoke related um, deaths in uh, London. And it, it led to a huge a movement in the West to say, we needed to clean up the environment. But that was a movement in some senses that came after the creation of wealth. It came to fix the problems temporarily of, or to put band-aids on the wealth creation um, machinery and to be able to see how do you move ahead. And that's what the Western environmental movement has actually done in the world. I think that if you look at the Western environmental movement, they have never really fixed the problem. They've always stayed behind the problem, but they've had the illusion of having clean air, of clean water, um, and yet today they have to invest even more in terms of cleaning the quality of fuel because as you clear, clean one pollutant, you have another pollutant in the air. The only advantage that they have is that they've, they've actually made environment into business. So it's good for you to have an environmental problem because you can generate another part of the economy to be able to fix it up. And that's been the model of environmentalism that has come from there. If you look at India's own environmental movement, in the, if you look at the 70s, the richest of our decades, we had two distinct environmental movements happening in India. You had the Project Tiger, which was uh, enacted in the 70s and 71. You had Chipko happening in 72. Uh, two very distinct calls to protect nature, two very distinct methods to protect nature. One saying that you needed to do what was done in the rest of the world. In fact, being the unfortunate chair of the project of the, of the TTF, I looked into tiger history. And I understood how that first decision came about. It wasn't a bad decision, but it came out of IUCN type organizations coming to India and saying, we needed to protect wilderness areas. The model was about protecting areas. There was concern about people, but it wasn't overriding concern. And then you had the Chipku movement, which basically was saying, no, 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 we need the trees for our own survival. So yes, we want to protect the trees, but not because we do not want to cut them. We want the right to be able to cut them. It's just that we do not think we will cut them, or we know we will not cut them like the woodcutters will, because our life depends on it. So two different strands that came out. And yet, if you look at India today, I think we have <coughs> both those. But I think over the last three decades, we have overwhelmingly seen a more middle class environmentalism emerge in India as well. An environmentalism which uh, will not get rid of plastic, but would like plastic collection to happen and would somehow believe that that will make the problem go away. So I think it's important for us to be able to understand those two strands because we have yet not globally been able to resolve them or even nationally been able to resolve them. But I think there is much more that is happening in India, which is possibly why I believe that the environmental movement in India is much richer and will have a lot more to be able to contribute. 
because if you look at the rest of the world, as I said, their environmentalism came after they had created wealth. We have an environmental movement which is coming at a period where we need growth, but we have intense poverty, we have intense inequity, we have large dependence on land, we have large dependence on forests, we have large dependence on natural resources. That's a huge advantage we have because the the two strands of what I would, what I now, what I increasingly call the environmentalism of the poor versus the environmentalism of the rich or the environmentalism of the middle class, they're two different types of uh, approaches on how to be able to look at the future. They're both happening in India. I think that's why we are rich um, in our um, in our environmentalism and our environmental activism. The question is, how can we expand the space for the environmentalism of the poor, and how can we make the environmentalism of the middle class understand the environmentalism of the poor better, and and to support it? And I think that's really where the challenge is. And I see, I mean, I, I, I was in Kerala, and one thing really struck me when I was in Kerala recently was this fantastic case of Trivandrum drowning in its garbage. Because to me, it was a classic. We've all grown up in the environmental movement hearing the word NIMBY, not in my backyard. But Kerala's backyard is somebody else's front yard. And so it's a perfect state where NIMBY has to operate. Now, this is a state where the city of Triv uh, Tiruvanthapuram cannot put its garbage in the, the village because the village panchayat uh, leader, a woman, and the mayor here is also a woman, one from CPM and the other one from, I think, the uh, one is UDF, one is LDF. Um, and essentially, the villagers are saying over our dead body, why would we let your waste come here? It's only leading to pollution here. Same thing is happening in Pune. Same thing is happening in many in Bangalore. Um, I think the more we will see this happen, the more, to my mind, it will force people to think about what to do next. Now, this is a connection. When Trivandrum, when I went to Trivandrum, I suddenly realized that. But this is exactly what I've been writing about for the last some years of the, the movements, the million pollution mutinies that are happening across India. So whether it is fights against power stations, whether it is fights against uh, Vedanta, whether it is fight against POSCO, uh, these are not fights happening because of middle class environmentalists. This is not because Ashish or I, maybe Ashish is, I'm certainly not uh, a leader in those movements over there. It's happening because of local communities. And it's happening not because of any high polluting inter generation, intra-generation science, it's happening because of sheer survival. It's happening because of the fact that people are poor. But the irony is and the tragedy is that modern development will only make them poorer. And that is something that they understand. When I, when I went to um, this village where there had been a firing because of the Tata steel plant that was coming up in Orissa, um, Kalinganagar. Um, what I mean, I mean it, you go there and there is no way that anybody who travels there will not come back saying, oh, these are desperately, wretchedly poor people. Then why are they fighting the steel plant? And you realize all of a sudden that they're fighting the steel plant because they realize, and it's not as if they're, they're very smart people. It is, uh, these are people where sons are working in industry. They're looking for uh, jobs also outside. But they realize that land has a very important purpose in their lives. It gives them the sustenance. It gives them livelihoods. And they also realize that modern industry at best can make them watchmen, at best can make them guards. They don't have the skills. They don't have the ability to be able to fit into the modern industry uh, framework. And the amount and more and more work that we do, we realize that how little employment is being generated in the, in the modern industrial framework. So what you really have today is a situation in which poor people are saying that, yes, they want development. They want growth. They do not have the luxury of saying they do not want lights, or they do not want fans, or they do not want schools, or they do not want health care. They want growth. But they're also saying that the model of growth that is being offered to them is only going to make them poorer. 
And that's really the, the battles that you're seeing across India. And those are also NIMBY battles. They are not different from the Tiruvanthapuram battle or the Pune battle or the Bangalore battle. These are all NIMBY battles. So I think that's where the space for the two, as I said, the two strands of environmentalism <coughs> come together. And to my mind, the, the only space that the, the work that we should all be doing is to try and expand the space for growth of that environmentalism, the poor. And it's very much what Leisha said, it's very much what Ashish said and Ravi said. It's really about how do you create the legal conditions, the, um, the conditions in which people have the right to decide. There have been fundamental things that have happened in this country, which are, I think, part of the reason why we are seeing democracy still being sustained. And we need to widen that space. There has been um, the Forest Rights Act, which gives people the right to decide, to give um, um, a no objection certificate. Obviously, it is inconvenient, but obviously, it needs to be nurtured, it needs to be improved. We have a public hearing process in the environmental impact assessment. We need to find a way that we can actually make that not just a hearing process, but a veto process. We need to make sure that there are many more ways in which that democracy of people being able to decide happens. I'm always, when I'm on, you know, the, 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 the whole attack is not just about growth, they said, Daji. It's also about the fact that can a few people hold, particularly in POSCO and others, hold the whole country ransom. I think the, the fact is that that is happening. And that's the strength of India. And I think that's what we need to find ways of saying, how can we expand it? How can we grow it? Because that's their legitimate right. Mm -hmm. At CSE, we're doing one very interesting thing, which it really gives me a lot of pleasure that we do. We do a community service, a free community service to anyone who wants an environmental impact assessment critiqued. We have, we have the ability to be able to, we are very good uh, people who can read environmental impact assessments. So it's, it's an amazing tool. If you can just critique an environmental impact assessment, we do it, we do it only for communities uh, and give it to them so that they can go to a public hearing and create a shinding. Uh, we are now making sure that those public hearings are uh, put on to uh, webcams and, uh, and put live on, on, on the website. Uh, create a condition in which if a public hearing happens and it's a fake public hearing, everybody knows it's fake. Create a condition in which if the public hearing happens and people get beaten up, everybody knows and is shamed about it. Create conditions in which the voices of the poorest and the voiceless get heard and get recognized. And to my mind, that's the only way we'll be able to resolve this uh, extremely, Ashish and I have known each other for a very long time, and he has the big words, I never can, can, can have all his sort of, the, the nice ways in which he puts it, uh, the big, the big sort of theory of it, I, I think the only way this theory is going to come together is if we can make sure that this democracy at the very grassroots, this environmentalism of the poor gets a chance to be recognized, to be heard, and then the environmentalism of the Indian middle class, I think, will be distinctly different from the environmentalism of the global middle class. So I think on that note, if it's okay, Mr. Ishwaran, I will... I will say thank you to everybody and thank you to SVWD for organizing this. Thank you, Varen. Thank you very much.